I'm very excited to uh, moderate to begin the discussion here for integrating crops and livestock. And if anything we have heard over the past day and a half so far, this is an important topic uh, that we all need to try to um, expand our knowledge on, learn more on, um, see where some of the challenges are and see where some of the opportunities are. Um, real pleasure for me to introduce Ryan Boyd, who I've never myself had the opportunity to hear speak, and yet, you know, you hear about people in the ag sector in the region who are doing innovative things, and I've definitely heard his name. Um, SGR Farms is a family farm, including Ryan and Sarah and their daughter Piper, along with Ryan's parents, Jim and Joanne Boyd. Uh, they've got a whole diverse gra grain production system, along with a May June calving cow herd. Um, so improving soil health has been a major means of achieving the goals of enhanced farm resources, financial viability, and quality of life. Several different management practices have been used to enhance the soil health, uh, including holistic plant grazing, high stock density uh, grazing, no-till, a diverse crop rotation, intercropping, winter grazing of corn, bale grazing, and stockpile grazing. Um, also along for the topic will be Martin Entz, one of my favorite professors when I was uh, at University of Manitoba. It's probably all the introduction he needs. Yeah, he still is my favorite prof from uh, back in those days. So with that, uh, then I will pass things over to, uh, to Ryan. Thanks, Stuart. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I, I would have probably came here, I would have been here anyways if not speaking. This I, I was fortunate to be at the previous Prairie Organics conference a couple years ago and blown away by the, the knowledge and the networking opportunities, so glad to be here. So as Stuart said, we're family farm, we're actually not too far from home here. We're, we farm about 10 miles north of Brandon. Forest is the town that I would call home. Um, it's been a family farm roughly 70 years. That's about when my grandma and grandpa bought their first piece of land in the mid 40s. Uh, my dad and mom are still involved with the operation. Uh, I've kind of, I have assumed full management and uh, and ownership of it. So I, my dad's on his way out. Where where our succession plan is rolling along nicely. My wife, Sarah, and uh, daughter Piper. She's four. Bingham's a little over one. I hope they didn't bother anybody. But I, I had to bring Sarah to hear Jonathan this morning in that presentation. If you saw the kids running around upstairs, that was mine. So. I guess I, I got to be up front, like anybody that doesn't know me, I'm not an organic farmer. So uh, I feel like I have to clear the air right now and uh, get that off my chest. I am an aspiring organic farmer. I've, I've, I've been brought up in the zero till age and that's what I'm having a hard time letting go of that. But every time I hear somebody talk like Jonathan and, and uh, talking with lots of other people, I, I know that's not the solution. What we're doing now, we use far too many chemicals, but we're working on that. We are reducing that, and we are experiencing what I think is good results. So, currently, we're a couple thousand acres of crop annual crop land, about 300 commercial cows, and a, a quite a bit, like 1,500 acres of uh, perennial pasture, tame perennial pasture. And then, but all of our land is fenced, so we utilize all areas for grazing at some point in the year, usually. And I think the goal setting, like I've, I'm a student of a holistic management and uh, I firmly believe that we, before we do anything, anything, we need to have a goal and, and work towards that, make our decisions based on the, what we want to see in the end. So a goal for our farm, farm should provide a flexible, low stress life, constantly increasing the health of the land, community, and our family. So. So when I came back to the farm, we it was in, I graduated university in 05, and I've always been on the farm, fairly close to the farm, never got too far away. Came back in 05, that was before grain prices really took off, so it was tough. E economically, it was, a, it was a challenge. That was about the same time uh, Fusarium was really coming in in the wheat, like we were starting to spend more money and, it was, and we were getting less for our crops and it, it just wasn't a good scenario. And I, I was young and uh, full of energy coming out of university. Well, I'm going to farm. I got, I can do this. This is no big deal. Really had a humbling year, first year back. So I really wanted to. I've always wanted to farm full time, and I said I don't want to. Farm, I don't want to work off farm. I want to truly be a farmer. And it, and and that was what led me down this path to to crop livestock integration. I figured that is where I could drive some economics 
diversify the, the, the income streams and hopefully produce a profit every year. Um, so we want to, when we're thinking about the farm, it's a three-legged stool. You got the economics, we want to be profitable because at the end of the day, if we're not, we're not farming. So we can't, we don't have the opportunity to, to do any of these good practices to improve the resources. And, and more and more as I've come down this road, the social aspects, like, and like the pesticide thing really bothers me, the, the, what we're losing off our farms, but more so the nutrient density of the food. And I don't care how we get that, what system it is, but I really believe what, what we eat is, like our health comes from that. And, and it, I, I guess I could talk for a long time about that and I'll, I'll share just the little things that, that have kind of tweaked my interest watching the cattle graze. So, and the environment, it, we can do better. I think that it's obvious, it's all blowing, um, flooding, that kind of thing. I've seen it, I know we can do better and if we know we can, we, we need to be trying. So, regenerative agriculture, that is kind of the, the thing that I, I would like to say I operate under that premise and I guess when, as we're improving, I think we, we do fit in there. So the journey started to mimic the prairie. That was the easy solution for me. If I want to stop the, the damage I'm doing with the chemicals, the pesticide, tillage, lack of diversity, it's, it's easy to turn it into perennials. We've, the research has long showed we can increase organic matter with perennials. We know that 100 years ago, the soils around here were 14% organic matter before they were broke. So to me, the grazing thing was just a simple, easy solution, I thought. Uh, it, in theory it is, and, uh, but then you need economics. You know what time, uh, how the cattle market was in, in 05, not long after the BSC prices were, were pretty low. But I also thought, okay, I'm young, if I'm gonna buy into anything, cattle is probably as good a place as any. If I can go to town and buy bred cows all day for six, seven hundred dollars, let's, let's consider that, and that's kind of the road we went. So, with the perennial system, we were, and back to the goal setting, the, the cattle operation, I, I, I had it in my head what I wanted for a cow, a, a low maintenance, smaller frame, Angus type animal. And we went through a lot of cows trying to cull and, and select for what we wanted. So it drives me nuts when I drive around the country and I see herds of cows that are just mixed breeds. Or they've got four different breeds of bulls and running together and it's just, there's no plan in mind. And I don't know how you can build a cow herd with, without any breeding program, any selection pressure. So we try to let the cattle sort themselves, let, let nature select. So we, because the whole system really, the livestock is such an in integral part, it needs to be profitable and it can be. And so we try to operate a cow herd that I would call a zero depreciation. And what that means, we don't try to own any animals that are losing value. So we keep all our heifers, we run them with a the bull, where we breed them grow them up and I don't want a cow over five years old on my farm. If she's five years old, that's probably when she's gonna to start depreciating. So I'm looking at selling bred cows or pears or, or any combination of that before that. We've started breeding our own bulls. We run 30, 40 yearling bulls with the cow herd, let them. I, I have gave up trying to select cattle to work in our program because it's, it's very humbling when you start selecting and thinking you know what you're looking for because it's the cattle know they know how to select so we let them do that <coughs> so we mimic the prairie we mob graze we, we we move cattle pretty much every day all year um in a perfect world there's i would move more often some sometimes depending on what season it is the grass grows and, and whatnot so so we have saw incredible results the We've got pastures that are about 10 years old, tame pastures, and uh, when they first started growing, they looked really awesome. They had big, bulky plants, but the nutrient density in those plants, like the micronutrients when you did a forage test, were not great at all. And we, we had a lot of problems with foot rot, pink eye initially. But just by doing nothing else, no inputs, no other than management, we were able to work those pastures. Now when I take a forage test, I can go back to GPS location four years later, and something strange has happened because the mineral profile in that forage is, is 
is exactly what like the NRC guidelines are saying. The science is showing what the needs of the cow are. So I don't, it's kind of funny how that happened, but cattle are healthier. So when I started to see that, that's when I was thinking, well, if we're growing our crops for food under that same system and the cattle are unhealthy, it's no stretch of the imagination to think that it's affecting my health or the consumer's health or my customer's health. So we, we need to do better. So that's, that's when, and around the same time this is all happening, I, I'm watching and I've been fortunate to have been down to Gabe Brown's place a few times and heard Jay talk several times. So I, I'm drinking the Soil Health Kool-Aid and I'm, <laughs> I'm sold on it. Uh, so we're set out to perennialize the cropping system because at that time, you know, just to dump everything into the livestock, the, the money wasn't there. We needed the economics of the crop crop cash flow that's as simple as it as it is so we we are a low disturbance uh, zero till farm we run a single disc opener drill a john deere drill um, i we used to focus on a high diversity of crops a long crop rotation but uh, as i'm learning now with the livestock integration i can cram like a well, a lifetime of crop rotation diversity into one year and bring the cattle in, mob that down and see massive changes to the soil right now. Like we're talking within a couple months, you can see visible changes to water infiltration, soil structure, just the life in the soil and, and on the farm. So the soil health principles, we've, we've, we're all familiar with that. Reduce, eliminate tillage keep the soil covered, increase diversity, living roots for as long as possible, and animal integration. So, and I think we have to acknowledge that agriculture is not a natural system. So we are gonna have to put some sort of diversity into that system to, or sorry, disturbance into that system if we wanna maintain an annual system or, or even harvesting cattle like that. There's disturbance involved there trying to keep the, if we just abandon the land, we're in an aspen parkland region. Like if I don't graze intense enough, it'll trees will come and grow. So I think it's important to acknowledge the cropping system, agriculture, where it's not totally natural, but we need to try our best to mimic it. So the first first go around we had on uh, cover crops. I came home from Gabe Brown's one summer. There was a grazing club bus tour, and I. So okay, I gotta try this. So we harvested some barley, went out, planted a simple mix, like three, four way radish uh, turnips, <coughs> some red clover, but that was my result. So, and it was a dry fall as normal, but that's maybe a month of growth in the fall time. So I, I probably spent $20 an acre, uh, plus seeding cost, that's what I got. And I looked at that and I think, okay, well that's, not paying the bills there is there's not twenty dollars an acre worth of grazing there never mind 40 or whatever you figure it costs to seed it so i kind of i left that i didn't know what to think of that okay is my drill i was still using a, a shank type opener just dis, high disturbance kit and okay did it was it because it didn't grow as soon was it my machinery wasn't right what's the how am i going to capitalize on this i guess was the question so a couple of years go by and I heard, uh, was down in Bismarck again, and uh, Dave Brandt was there, another guy that runs a farm kind of like Gabe, except he's a cropper, and he's in a higher moisture uh, area, like 20 inches of rain a year, we'd get half that. And that's when it hit me, okay, if he's growing in his off season, enough feed for the soil to grow a big cash crop the next year, I maybe need to take a full season. The, the, it's rain makes, growth so i figured one year of of rain do my soil building phase there and then a couple of things then with that the cattle market was increasing in value i needed more pasture so that's what we did planted some the rains came it was phenomenal growth that's what the soil looked like we were out there grazing this field it was raining and i'm thinking ah this is not going to be good it's going to be compacted it's it's just not good because we were strip grazing like a high density probably i don't know 100,000 pounds an acre of stock density on the crop field but that's what happened i went out took a spade out of the ground and that's what came up for soil and it was like it just hit me 
the smell, the soil. It was like when I was a kid digging in the backyard. You pull up the sod and what the soil smelled like, it, it just smelled good. It, it, it just intuitively feels right. And that's what I saw in the field. And that was the first time I've ever seen that in my fields. Like when I came home from Gabe's, I went out to the pasture. It was a dry, dry time of the summer, like August. I broke the handle off a shovel trying to get it in the ground. So when I saw this, the, the changes, it just hit me and it was like, okay, how do we make this work? So another year or two goes by. I figured, okay, we're going to scale this up. So we went, that initially was like my 30 acre test field next to my neighbor's lane that really makes him scratch his head. But so then we scaled it up. We went 500 acres of uh, cover crops next year, which was significant because that was 25% of our cropping acres at the time. So I just went into it. the warm season blend is what I'm showing here because that's what I really think we lack in our diversity of our cash crops is the warm seasons. So I was focused heavily on that and we let that grow up all year. It's tough to watch initially because it really come out of the ground slow. It takes a while, like at least probably 30, 40 days before it really canopies. And then once 45, 50 days hit and if the rain is helping you, it can just explode. And we've seen anywhere from say 5,000 pounds of dry matter to uh, I would I would guess 10,000 pounds of dry matter when I figure out what my cows ate and what I'm estimating I trampled. So there's huge potential here. But I want to say last year, whatever it was, myself and I have lots of friends, the cover crop year last year, it just wasn't as good. I don't know if it was just strictly moisture or if it was just how the season progressed. I don't, I don't know, but a ton of potential there. So I, I've been averaging about 80 to 120 cow days an acre and then when I say a cow day I'm talking about a cow calf pair. That's that's what I run on this or I have been up till now in the fall time. Like a 1200 pound cow with say a three 400 pound calf. So we grazed these cover crops that year. It was 15 right through till it was December when we came on. And uh, the turnips, the cattle need, a, it's a learning curve for the cattle too to, to figure this out. Like when you turn them out into something like that and you can't see them over the back. It's stuff they've never seen before, but when they figure it out, they love it. And they, the performance is, is fantastic. The health is great. Like I'm to the point where I'm, I'm hesitant to put my cattle, we used to do a lot of stubble grazing in the fall. I'm hesitant to put my cows on the stubble because it's breeding season for me in September, October, to go and put them on my crop field that I know is not up to snuff in terms of fertility and, and everything else. Like, if I could have them on stuff like this to breed back, everything is just so much better. And we're stockpiling our perennial pasture at this time of the year when it, it needs it the most. Uh, we're giving it that chance to stockpile. And this is the other thing. Every time we do this, like I can pick the best picture every time, but it, it, the, with the diversity, everything is different every year within the field i could sow the same mix on every field on my farm and it wouldn't look the same on any of the fields so the first year this this is a picture if you look in the hollow it's not real clear here but like that's an insane amount of dry matter in the bottom corner where the cows are in this picture like i don't even know i wouldn't want to guess but i'll bet you there's way over way north of ten thousand pounds of dry matter there but then you go up the hill where there was more herbicide residue, wild oak pressure, like we're probably looking at more three, 4,000 pounds. So it's, it's trying to look at that. Why did it happen? What do I got to do to, to get more of the high potential, the, the good results? And that's the beauty of this. Like, I think there's a lot of people experimenting with this kind of thing. Like three or four years ago, even I would have said, the expertise was limited in our part of the world but I was at a meeting a couple of weeks ago at a holistic management conference it wasn't a large group but it was fair fair good size 150 people and now this was people of Saskatchewan Manitoba mostly a few Albertans but I'll bet you in that room half the people had experimented with things like this and the knowledge when we get together and we start talking about what worked what didn't what are we going to try next year how are we going to make this work it's picking up steam and that it really excites me when we start uh, 
start talking about that. And another thing, so when I look at the plants in these mixtures, and we look at how healthy they are, there's no disease. Like the, one of the first times I grew an intercrop, a polycrop, it was for green feed. And I planted basically leftover seed. I had peas, wheat, a little bit of oats, and some millet I threw in. And so I just let that grow. I cut it for green feed. But when you walked out in that field, the, like the wheat heads were massive and healthy. The leaf disease is, is not there. The peas are standing up, which they're usually laying down by the time fall comes because the disease is getting to them. Like the disease just goes away. And so that's a visual, it's obvious. It's like, okay, well, how do I make that work on my annual crop field? Because this is green feed, but why couldn't we? Like I was so tempted to combine some of it and I never did just because it, it was something like, what would I do with the seeds when I did it? It was small scale, but intercropping, the potential to intercrop the cash crops, especially in the organic system when you can, even if you had a reduced yield because you're learning, the, it's mind boggling the profit potential of, of the intercropping. So, and, and back to the learning curve here. So, in 2005, we went all in on the cover crops. The next year, it was, okay, what's, what's the next step? I'm just going to go out and, in my case, I sprayed because that's, that's what I do in the spring for my weed control. In zero till, I've, I've learned the hard way. If you don't control the weeds in the spring, you won't get a very good crop. And when I'm, when I'm selling that crop for five bucks a bushel, that hurts. So, anyways, the sweet clover, like, everything breaks down fairly quick in this scenario. And it was relatively clean, but there was enough stuff there that uh, I, would, I, I would have to do a weed control. The sweet clover just laughed that off and kept growing. And, but if you look there, the wheat establishment is, since I started using that single disc opener, I've struggled with hair pinning, I've struggled with like mud, just and overpacking the seed roll, and uneven emergence, like it, it, it has been a stressful, or it was a stressful few years trying, trying to dial that in on our soil type. But look, this establishment is as good as I've had anywhere on the farm to date, and that's, that's next to no fertilizer. It's just, I attribute that to the animal impact, the, the improved soil structure um, of the, of the polycrop. So I was fighting it, I'm fighting the, the consequences of my mob grazing, my massive influx of nutrients into the system, because that's what we do. You put that, all that biomass through the cow, the, the fertility you're putting out the back, like it's significant. It's no different than going out and spreading a bunch of fertilizer. So what happens when I spread a bunch of fertilizer? Well, the wild oats go nuts along with a few other things. And that's what I was seeing there. So then trying to think, okay, what, what does that mean? Well, luckily, I got chased out of the field with some rain and I left 20, 30 acres of a field that I was, this is the same deal, like the, that last year was that where the millet was so tall and the cows were walking, you couldn't see them. This is the same field the next year, the sweet clover. So I, I grazed the crap out of that field in the spring because I figured, well, I'm uh, weak in those plants and uh, I, need, I need grazing in April. That's when, like high quality grazing in April is, is, is worth a lot to me. So I camped my uh, yearlings, my calves, out on this quarter for the year. They just or for the month of April, pretty much, until I was ready to seed in May. And they just continuously grazed the orchard grass and the, the hairy vetch and the red clover, sweet clover that was that was coming. And I thought, well, that'll weaken it. <coughs> and then, so I, it, as the conditions conspired, I didn't get my cash crop established. And that's what happened. Like the. The clover growth was phenomenal, but there was, you can only really see the clover, but I'm telling you, there was orchard grass, the big healthiest orchard grass you've ever seen in the bottom of it with the red clover and everything else. So my thoughts are, why am I fighting this? I, like The biggest inhibitor to the adoption of cover crops in my mind is the cost. Well, if I can go and spend $40 an acre one year and take a massive grazing off in the fall, some high value, high energy grazing the fall, second year do the same thing and then either I those perennials I have established in the bottom carry on as some highly productive healthy nutrient dense pasture or that's when we would consider 
go to the disc or whatever and, and establish the cash crop and intercrop, carry this diversity, feed the bugs, feed the feed the soil microbes with the intercrop cash crop after that. So that's kind of the direction I'm I'm headed with that. And it, and this took me so this was this was 2016. Last year I was kind of I backed off a little bit because I had to process in my mind and and, tr and try to see what try to make sense of this all and so that's where that's where I'm at right now next year that's that's the program we're going to be on the, it'll be a the, the full season cover but it'll be a two-year commitment if not longer and again there's so much to learn so here's same field the, on the right I had uh, grazed it harder than I like to in in July but it regrow the regrowth was was significant and it's lush high quality where on the left um, I didn't graze it it's all brown and, and mature I was lacking protein the cows needed a protein they could have used a protein supplement uh, in October November when I was grazing that so and I really didn't hurt my dry matter production by grazing I don't think looking at what I took in the summer compared to what was there in the fall that light grazing in the summertime did not hurt me at all if anything it, it should have paid huge dividend because of the stimulation of the of the cattle on the microbes on the plant to release sugar exude root exudates and and just fire that biology up in the midsummer which is is really what we need like it's it's one thing to to graze that that polycrop in on frozen ground but it it's rocket fuel i think in the height of the growing season when the things are moist and, and thawed and everything's just firing on all cylinders so in that, that uh, I talked quite a bit with old Doug Northam here, trying to figure out what where my next move is. Like I'm getting burnt out trying to manage cattle and crops and diversity, and it's just young family. Everything is. It, last summer I was getting burnt out, and I'm trying to plot my next move. I really think there's potential if I have the expertise with grazing, with cattle, and I have the cow herd that is adapted to this type of system, this type of management, I think we could blow the roof off of the profitability of the of the soil building phase. So when I look at my numbers at 65 to 120 cow days per acre is what I've been getting with the pairs. And I'm gonna say that's on 2,600 to 4,800 pounds of dry matter consumed. Like you could double that, because I'm the goal would be to take half, leave half. Uh, if you don't have enough cattle, take less. Do the cattle being on the field? They don't need. It's not the cattle putting it through the system. I I don't think that is is the benefit or all the benefit. So if you run those numbers back and say instead of running cows, I'm going to run stalker calves, four to like 450 pounders, let's say. Put them on there first of October because that's when the cattle run starts. There's volume you can do that. We've done that. I've bought. We've ran yearlings before, as we were building the cow herd. We we bought one year 400 uh, heifer cows, like four to five hundred pounders. They were like four hundred dollars, and it it works. It, put them on there. They would gain. They would gain at least two pounds a day. I'm more than confident of that. So you you figure if I could get 200 days that's this is ultra conservative 200 days an acre with a yearling and they put 200 pounds an acre or two pounds a day that's 400 pounds an acre and right now the way the calf market is at two bucks a pound like the, the slide on calves is about a, a 10 slide which means every 100 pounds you increase their 10 cents less so you buy them at 240 put 150 pounds or 200 pounds on they're going to be 20 cents less so that's about it, you work the number roughly two dollars a pound is what the market is paying at four hundred dollars an acre like i can't ignore this any longer i've been waiting for the numbers to line up in my nerve to get strong enough to, to do this i think this is it this like the cattle market and then the beauty of this situation if you can run a sell buy marketing scheme one that it's basically inventory management you're not buying in may and selling in october and what you paid in the spring affects your profitability in the fall it's the profitability is more dependent on cash flow what you sell in the fall 
your profitability, your cash flow depends on what you buy back in at. So you're always buying and, or selling and buying on the same market. So I'm to the point now, I think I, I see huge potential for that type of system. And this would work way better if I could find somebody to partner with locally. If somebody was close to home, we didn't have to use, the, like the trucking costs can add up fast with moving cattle to different places and custom grazing. But somebody locally wants to work together, I don't need to be the guy fixing, maintaining machinery, owning the machinery. I'd put all that capital into the cattle and I think there's massive potential for anybody that wants to, to get into managing livestock in this way. Another thing, winter cereals is a big part of what we do. Like excess moisture has been the story for a lot of years here lately. It's dry now, but I, when I see water running off the land or snow blowing off, I just, I just think it's such a squandered opportunity. Excess water is such a squandered opportunity to, to grow soil, to improve the system, to feed the microbes, fix carbon, like suppress weeds with that growth. Um, fill gaps in the grazing uh, season, spring, fall grazing. So I just find it's, a, it's an easy entry into the cover cropping world, winter cereals. And we actually have a program in Manitoba that uh, pays you to grow winter cereals, or sorry, pays you to grow a cover crop and where you should do it too. Because if you go, I, I shouldn't say this because it's being recorded and there's maybe some Manitoba crop insurance people here. If I plant winter wheat on pea stubble, a pretty good chance it's gonna winter kill. But, so I can get like, they pay you 50 bucks an acre because it winter kill. Okay, that's too bad. Guess I'll plant something else now. Like, and they, they figured this out only within the last two or three years that you, it was used to be a lot, well, I'm not gonna talk anymore about that. <laughs> I'm not a fan of government handouts. I don't waste my time filling out the case forms or whatever the income stabilization thing because we got cattle lives so we never we're never in a position for a payment but if there's free money on the table and it and it it fits what i'm gonna do anyways why not i'll take it <laughs> so so again back to winter cereals <coughs> soybeans are taking over manitoba it's scary it's good, it's a divert, another crop in the wheat canola rotation, but the soil that I see blowing, the, yeah, I just, it's, it bothers me what the results are of the, the soybeans coming into the area. We've, we're typically a uh, zero till area. People are starting to till. Yeah, it's been wet, but whatever. They, the mindset is you gotta have a black soil to grow soybeans, to, to get this, them warmed up and going quick enough in the spring to mature in the fall. Okay, fine. Pea ground, I planted uh, fall rye. If I screwed up, I planted fall rye and that crop won't winter kill. So <laughs> it grew in the spring. Turned the cows in, I got about two or three weeks of grazing for 200 dry cows. And then some rain was coming, so I took them off. This was mid, well, it was before calving. So I guess I took them off in end of May, first of June kind of thing. Um, let the rye grow for a few days. I wanted to take the cows off soon enough because the, the, the hoof action of the cow will germinate some wheat seeds uh, and that can lead to a flush of wheat. So I figured, okay, I gotta take them off and have that wheat flush for a week or two before I, I deal with it. Uh, so we planted the soybeans directly into, and, and this rye by this time, we're in mid-June, so it had headed out. It wasn't flowering, but it was headed out. It was, it was taller than my drill. It was probably three feet tall. We seeded direct into it. I sprayed it out, killed the, the rye, the beans come up. And now this is particular field has been a wild oat problem for me. But when you have that winter cereal plant growing in there, it, it, I don't know, plants talk or whatever it is, they, the wild oats don't come as bad. And that was definitely the case. There was not, there was reduced weed pressure because of the rye cover. Long story short, the beans grew. Um, one neighbor, I remember he drove by the field when I was seeding it. <laughs> Out there when you can't hardly see the drill from the road, like looking across the field, and he's thinking, what, what's he doing now? Because he's already gave me a hard time about, aren't you gonna graze any more crops this spring? Because I'd graze another fall rye crop the year before. 
and whatever. I helped him combine. We worked back and forth together. So I, I'd been in his soybean field combining, and he was back in my field combining this particular field, and it was every bit as good, if not better. Like I sold it, it was 44 bushels an acre. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, that would be a very respectable soybean yield in our area. <coughs> So to diversify the cash crops, I think I touched on that. Like it, we got to get the diversity and intercropping massive potential. Where I'm starting to think, yeah, the, the cash crop diversity, like a long rotation, that's a lot to manage. Like cleaning the cedar out 10 times during spring when you got a two week or a month, 30 day window, like you only got X number of days for prime seeding. That's a lot of work and it can be stressful. By the time you get the drill calibrated, you're done. So. If I can get cram the diversity into my livestock polycrop, that's what I'm going to do. And if I can figure out how to grow a, like a two or three way intercrop on that uh, as my cash crop, that's that's where I want to be. Another another picture here when uh, if you've never drove a quad or a truck, I like the quad across your field in July. It's better when you do it in the cover crop that you've got to stand on the seat to look to see where you're going. But I think that's one of the biggest issues. Like most of the farmers, like I think, I think it was Gary or, or Martin said back in university, like the, the best fertilizer is the farmer's footsteps. Well, there's a lot of fields I bet you in our area that haven't had a footprint in them for several years. The guys check the crop on their, on their side by side at 40 mile an hour or through the windshield of their sprayer or their truck, they're not getting out there and experiencing it. Like when Jonathan talks about the decline in the bugs, like the windshield test, you don't get that in the field because you can't drive fast enough. So you kind of have to get out and experience it. Like if you get out in that cover crop and you take your shovel and you're digging around and you, you, you feel the life, like you feel good out there, but you don't get that from the seat of a truck or a tractor. So that's, I think, if we could get farmers in the field again, actually walking, and not at the approach either, I'm talking <laughs> in the middle of the quarter, like get out there and experience it, we would all be far better off. So, in, and now the relay crop thing is, is really intriguing me. If I can, this is when I was more thinking, how do I make this grain system work? When I was, I'm, I'm not sure how much more of this I'm gonna do because it is very machinery intense, like seeding, a, seeding twice a year. So really cropping, plant a winter cereal, uh, establish another crop in it in the springtime that when I take the winter cereal off, it's gonna take over the growth and, and provide me with some diversity, some cattle feed and soil cover and feed the bugs in the off season. So there's guys that are doing this in the States with very good success with soybeans, wide row soybean, or sorry, wide row winter wheat. And then in the spring, they plant their soybeans. This is a conventional system, um, but way reduced inputs. So they're talking like 100 bushel winter wheat and 50, 60 bushel beans. And this is that blows me away. I was at a conference in Kansas last winter and there was a guy from Alberta selling the flex finger crop lifters and they make an attachment that you could put on the lifter spot and it's like a plate that is like a divider so if you got a relay crop growing between your rows you could it kind of holds them off the knife so you can cut your wheat and not harm the soybeans or whatever it might be your forage underneath and he said so there's a guy in North Dakota uh, two years ago grew 50 bushel winter wheat and 20 bushel beans. I was like, okay, that's not that far away. So I, I tried it last year. We planted some 15 inch, uh, 15 inch winter wheat, but also in the spring, I, this was on a pea field again, so winter kill. So <laughs> I didn't keep the entire field uh, so I, but I didn't want to lose this trial because I was, I really wanted to see what the potential was. So we had winter wheat on 15 inch rows with soybeans seeded in between and also a brassica mixture seeded in between like a forage, like a fall grazing is what I was going for. And, but I also did oats with the same scenario seeded the same time and wheat, spring wheat seeded the same time in the wide rows with the forage in between. 
and that's what it looked like. like it, last spring was wet, we had moisture to start all this, and we run RTK guidance uh, to try and make this work. I, I thought I needed to spend the money on RTK, I wish, I'd a, I, I wish I had that back, because I think we could do this slight angle would be just as effective, you'd be between the rows all the time. So anyways, it didn't look too bad off the start. It, it really intrigued me, the spring cereals, how on that wider row, uh, they just bushed out, the heads were bigger than normal, and the yield depression, I don't, if there was one, I, it wasn't very much. I don't have a yield monitor in, in the old 1680, and I don't have a scale, so. It was really just, I did it more as a demonstration just to get a feel for it and see the potential where, what, where, where could this work. So, and then we kind of, and then again, here's the brassicas. So in a lower spot where there was more moisture, they really, they came on, on the drier knolls, there wasn't as much. And of course, like there's no in-crop weed control here. It, having that diversity and I think too, it also helped the, the weed pressure was definitely reduced because it was winter wheat, albeit sparse winter wheat, the, that spring growing. So, yeah, we can do it with uh, less inputs, no doubt in my mind. And then it dried out, like we just, it just quit raining. And what looked like it would have been very, very interesting to try and harvest the soybeans, I did. And like there was some beans there, but that's not the potential. This is. For me, in a in a mixed farming scenario, the, the the option, the potential to add your diversity to your simple, easy to manage cash crop is right there. Put it down in the blank rows, and it gives you the wheat suppression, the all the things we need to build the soil and and help the resilience of the system right there. Our nutrient program, like I used to be, really hung up on. I am exporting too many nutrients and not bringing enough in. So our, we've sold the hand equipment a long time ago. We buy all our feed in, all our hay bales, and I, we bale graze, we, we import the nutrients. But I'm really questioning this. Like long term, I don't want to be buying anything. I want everything from within the farm, except maybe a little bit of seed that I, I can I cover crop diversity seed that is not worth growing on ourselves. So import the nutrients there. I'm seeing really, I don't know what you'd say, but soil tests where guys within 10 miles of me in two years time with diversity and mob grazing have went from soils that showed five parts per million Olsen phosphorus to 10 or 15 in two years and to a point where they didn't believe it. So they sent, it was a, it was the local agronomist soil testing. They sent them back to the same spot as GPS benchmark, retested, same result. And, and, and the organic matter on that test also, we're talking a 1% increase in two years. It's like, should I be that hung up on this nutrient import, outport, if the diversity is, is tapping into those nutrients down below, is, is making things available? I think maybe we're missing the mark on the nutrient balance. It's, it's, it's harnessing the power of the, the <coughs> diversity of the microbes. Bale grazing, like, that's what it looks like. Bale graze, set the bales out, let the cows eat them, drive all the neighbors nuts for a month or two as they look at that mess in the spring, and then uh, let it grow. Like it, this is a concern I have with bale grazing. You're putting a, probably one of the reasons why it's so effective on the pastures is nitrogen. Because in the feedlot, you're in the, in the feedlot, in the corral, the nitrogen volatilizes off a lot of it, it's lost. So in the field though, if there's snow on the ground or whatever, the nitrogen is staying there, or at least a lot of it, and going in the ground. So what, brome grass is like the wild oat of the perennial world. It just goes bonkers, it loves that. And that's fine if cattle like it and it, it's good feed. It, um, but you gotta be careful. Like if you have a really nice diverse native pasture, I wouldn't be going out there and bale grazing with like a brome grass hay because that brome grass could take over in a hurry. I would use a straight alfalfa or something that you're not as likely to introduce an invasive to that native. Because the native, like I think it was Jay said yesterday morning, like the native pastures are just going extinct everywhere and it's it's tragic so this is again 
the potential growth forage when you start using all the available water and using the animal impact and running a long recovery period, high density is, is phenomenal. And there's other things with crop livestock integration, like we sold the harrows. I don't do any mowing around the edges of the fields. Like lots of guys will run around their field with a, a mower because that's where their, their cedar or their tiller plugs up on that grass around the edge. I just put the cows out. Here's one, there's a blind mile. Next one of my pastures, half mile long. It's maybe, I don't know, 50 yards wide or whatever, just run a hot wire graze that like I don't charge the RM to do that but I, I might start invoicing <laughs> and pasture cropping that's another one really intrigued me like what Colin Sice is doing over in Australia amazing results for the soil and and just able what he's able to do but our system our environment like most of our pastures are cool season dominant and our, our growth curve on the cool season is so fast I have a hard time getting anything established like and I only tried this once and that was when the pasture was relatively new so the alfalfas and the grasses and everything were still quite uh, well all of our pastures really we they they have a lot of jump to them in the spring so I grazed the crap out of it in the fall went and seeded this uh, like early September I did a few strips of rye a few strips of wheat it was dry that fall, so that it didn't germinate as quick, uh, as nice as it should, or I would have liked to have saw. The next spring, uh, it was, you could find the plants, but the, that intensive grazing and the rec long recovery that I gave it, it was actually, it just brought the pasture on even stronger. So I haven't had success with that. I thought that was important to put that in here. I have a lot of learning experiences, <laughs> way too many, but, when I'm trying to figure something out, if, I, if I'm looking at trying something new, different, if I'm an Excel addict, uh, I, I spend far too much time staring at that spreadsheet. If I can use my farmer intuition on what I think I can grow, and the worst case scenario still isn't too bad and shows a slight profit, but it, world upside, I'll, I'll go after it. And I've learned you know, keep it in check. Don't plant half the farm to something that you've never done before, but plant it on enough acres that it gets your attention and demands your management when it needs it because there's there's so much to be learned. And honestly, with the cows and the crops, every any, any of my screw-ups, the crops can eat, the cows can eat, so it's, it's usually worked, so. And yeah, some of the barriers, opportunities of what we're doing, I've, taught, I've said it a lot, and I don't want, maybe I'm greedy, maybe I am, I don't know, like, I, I need to make money in the system, so if I don't make money and my farm is rented out or sold, I don't know that a guy that would do, is an organic person or a regenerative type farmer going to be one to buy that or take it over? Probably not, so it needs to pay the bills, that's, the economics need to work. And, and we look at it at a whole farm uh, scenario, right? My number on the whole farm needs to work. I'm more than willing to sacrifice on my soil building years if the number on the bottom at the whole farm is the, is the number that I need to, to make my overheads, to pay my parents their retirement that they need, their, their revenue and, and, and all that. So. But another thing that's really challenging with the livestock is water. It's simple. Everywhere we go, the sloughs have been drained. The, the, the water infrastructure that we had naturally on the prairies is gone. And that's a challenge. We deal with water all the time. We have a lot of pipeline, a lot of dugouts, several wells, but well water is not reliable in enough quantity. So that, I underestimated that when we started I thought, oh, we got sloughs everywhere. Well, that's no problem, we can deal with that. But then you run into some dry falls and those sloughs start getting low and the wells start going dry. <coughs> and it, it can be stressful. And like I, I mentioned, the skill set to manage cattle, not only on cropland, but anywhere with the ability to manage electric fence and, and move cattle and, and do it in a low stress way. I, there's not a lot of people that are really very good at that. 
So labor versus iron, I've long, I, I figured as a young person, I was, I was more than willing to put the labor in instead of the iron, like the capital cost of going and buying a tractor, just I, I'm over that a long time ago. But that is catching up with me too. Like I, I feel like I'm pretty young, but uh, you know, uh, you hurt your back or something, it really puts this into perspective. So that is, the labor thing is something I'm starting to look at more and more. We, we have a hired man, we uh, had a guy come to me we're looking for a job last spring and we took him on and it's working out very well. And that is a learning curve for sure, trying to manage people. But we need more people on the land. <clears throat> to make these systems work, it's people <laughs> that make them work, not jugs of chemical, not tractors, not diesel fuel it's people so whether that person is going to work for me or with me as a partner we just got to get more people out on the land priming the carbon pump and i i would have said a few couple of years ago that i was a carbon farmer that was my main uh that's what i want to do put carbon in the soil and now i think after listening to jonathan this past week like it really is the regenerative flag that i want to fly it's not carbon farming because that is what I believe the currency of the soil is, is carbon, but it's it's more than that. It's the system, it's the whole farm. Um, regenerative agriculture, that's that's where it's at, and I hope that's where what we're gonna see a whole bunch more of here in the near future. It's happening. So the future, like I said, intercropping really crops, there's potential there. But season long mixed annuals, fall grazing calves. I am gonna, I've spent the last 10 years learning how to manage livestock. I think it's time that I try to take that to the next level and, and harness that skill set that I think I have something that that is my competitive advantage. And that's that. The, uh, if you need to get a hold of me, I, I, uh, very fortunate I've, I've, gleaned a lot of information from a lot of different people over the last several years and that's what really drives the system the people networking working together talking <coughs> figuring it out we have a website of, i'm trying to trying to develop a brand that we can start marketing our, our farm products under so that, i figured that started with a, a website and that's the other thing though this whole regenerative system to me seems to hinge on the marketing, like we need to get paid for what we're doing. If we are producing a nutrient dense food, we need to get paid for that. And yes, I totally get that organic premium is there, but does that guarantee nutrient density? Is And so that's where the that angle I'm coming at, I wanna get paid for nutrient density. I don't care how it happens. And with that nutrient density, I want to sell the fact that I'm improving the environment, not degrading it. So. That's all I've got for now. I don't know how long I've rambled, probably like too long. But... So, we'll do questions first, yeah. so if there's a few questions uh, out on the floor, I can run out here. And then um, after questions, then Mark. Your watering system? Yeah. So it's a dugout, solar powered water system. So. <clears throat> In this little box here, there's uh, eight batteries, 24 volt system, all these panels, a windmill. Winter systems, I think it's critical to have a windmill because the sun just isn't reliable, but the wind is. And when you're gonna have problems, it's on windy days. <coughs> when the batteries are dying, because the wind is cooling them off. So we took an ice auger, I cut a hole in the, in the ice, big enough that I could get my pump down in there. Um, I, I made this insulated pipe. So it basically, I got a, like a, a six inch piece of hard pipe. And then inside that I ran an inch and a half pipe centered in it. And then I filled it with spray foam so it was insulated. So the idea being that at the ice surface where it's gonna freeze, that's insulated. And hopefully the pipe inside wouldn't freeze. So that pumps it up to the, to the there's a pill switch in this blue trough. There's two little holes in that lid that the cows stick their head in and drink out of. 
So it's just it stays thawed just from the water turn turnover, the the warmth of the water. There's a pill switch when they drink turns the pump on. When the when uh, the pill switch shuts off, the pump shuts off and the water drains back, so it doesn't freeze in the pipe. And then I've got it covered in straw, just trying to insulate it some more to try and keep it from freezing up the ice surface. But when you're below about 15 Celsius and any kind of wind, chances are that with that froze at the surface but I had a quick coupler so when I go to check the cows feed them in the morning uh, I just unhooked that quick coupler stuff the rebar and just poked it it is slushy but iced enough that it wouldn't the pump wouldn't push it through put it back together yeah I don't know it's it's not as complicated as it sounds but it's not simple either and that's what I mean like fighting water all winter long out in a field where you're trying to get your nutrients it can wear on a guy like Christmas Day. I was out. <laughs> Dad and I are out. Uh, not this particular system, but we spent a couple hours Christmas Day out in the field in the wind. It was cold, trying to get the thing unthawed and working. So you got to be committed to, to making these things work. Other questions? What was the cost of that? Of this system? This here, this is a standalone unit uh, that I use in the summertime. It's portable. It, it was about seven thousand dollars. This system is a separate system. Uh, it was maybe five thousand dollars, but it didn't come with the trough. We were very fortunate. Ten years ago, now almost twelve, maybe the environmental farm plan was around, and uh, we embraced that totally. The program at that point in time was really paying to, to for farmers to. To move to extensive wintering systems, ex ex intensive grazing, rotational grazing. This stuff really, it was a 50% uh, funded program, but they included in kind uh, labor and machinery. So, this, that program that we bought these under is what put the fence around our entire farm. I spent one summer ripping out barbed wire and building permanent electric high tensile fence around everything. It, it cost it cost about $100,000 to do that to our farm. Uh, water systems, fencing that one year. But I was able to run, uh, the, the, the farm plan program was 50,000 cap at that time and I ran three of them. My mom, my dad and me. <laughs> I was out the labor in a summer of work but we got all that infrastructure. And that's the thing, like these government programs like inc income stabilization, all that I think is just such a load of crap. Put programs like that in where I actually have to work. Throw me a bone. If you want to give me money, make me work for it, and and do it to on um, things like this that are really going to change the system, not just prop up the current current problems that are going to happen again next year. Yeah. 